Uh, it's lovely to be here today. I'd like to read this sentence at the bottom. I believe that we have to adapt our thinking processes, not only to reinvigorate our own lives, but to help create exceptional lives for the generations to come. I think this is really, really important, and I think we're at a point where we're not exactly sure where we're going to go. As I see the younger generations moving into an unknown world, I can sort of parallel it with my experience of coming into an unknown world, that being Istria. It's a little bit more known now to me. Um, I sort of built a little sort of a thinking map here, and you can see we, the system I have is to sort of question everything, cross-connect, build adaptive processes, fail and learn often, and also to trust your instinct. So we're going to go through a little bit, but first I want to start off with a little story, because I'm Irish and we like stories. They can be a little bit long, but this one is the so one. Um, I used to work in a very nice restaurant in Dublin, and many years ago, uh, there was a group of ladies that came in for a 30th, uh, no, 40th uh, birthday party, and uh, it's a restaurant you have to book a long time in advance. So they were enjoying themselves, and as they were finishing their main course, the owner came up and said, listen, ladies, hope you're enjoying your meal. We have uh, got a phone call from Bono. Bono's one of our regular guests, and he'd like to come in to eat. We do have spare tables, but he does like this table particularly. Would it be possible, when you're finished your main course, that we move you over to a different table, and we will compliment you a bottle of wine? Now, in this restaurant, a bottle of wine is approximately 100 euros. But the girls were pretty happy. Anyway, Bono and the team turned up, and the girls were getting a little bit merry and a bit excited on their bottle of wine. When Bono's guest who had come in, Bono was very well dressed. His guest looked pretty scruffy, actually. Um, sort of denim jacket and all that type of thing, beard, and not looking very good. And that wasn't normal for this restaurant. But it's Bono's guest, and Bono likes helping people, so it's quite normal. But when his guest went to the bathroom, one of the girls shot out to the bathroom to catch his attention and asked, would it be possible to get Bono's autograph? Now, in Ireland, we tend not to do this, but the girls, I think, had a little bit too much wine. Uh, the guy said, look, I'm not sure. Uh, I'll have a chat, and if it's okay, I'll call you over. So, the boys sat down and eventually called the girls over. The girls were really excited about this. The rest of the restaurant was laughing at them. They got their autograph, and eventually one of the girls pulled out a digital camera and gave it to Bono's mate and asked him, please, could he take a picture of Bono and the girls? The guy, unfortunately, didn't seem to know how to use a digital camera. After a few minutes, they managed to get the picture, so that was great. Eventually, the boys disappeared off, the girls went back to their table, got a bit of coffee and sobered up. When they asked for the bill, the owner came by and he said, actually, ladies, the bill has been taken care of. The girls were pretty shocked and embarrassed. They thought, oh, God, Bono's paid for our bill, and we really made fools of ourselves. And he said, no, actually, the gentlemen really enjoyed themselves, but it wasn't Bono who paid for your bill. It was Mr. Springsteen. <laughs> so I tell, you that, I tell you that story because it's a story about perception. We see what we want to see. And certainly my experience in Croatia, starting as an architect, uh, when I was in Dublin, is I only saw architecture. When I came here, I really had to find a different way to do things and a much more creative way of thinking to survive here. So I started off in OSIEC, and you can see standard of living, quality of life at the top there. For me, this was a huge shock, new thinking to me. I went to OSIEC in 2000, five years after the war. The place was trashed. Uh, but my experience there was that everybody was having a great time. So this was the first time I discovered there is a difference between the standard of living, which was very low in Osijek because things were really damaged and hadn't been repaired yet, and quality of life. The people of Osijek and the Slavonians si simply knew how to have a good quality of life. I thought it was something to do with the war, that they were so happy to have come through it, at least most of them. I discovered much later that Slavonians really know how to have a party any time of the year. So <laughs> a life less ordinary is something I certainly took on through my time between architecture and Irish dancing and all these different things and olive oil production and uh, writing a book. And many of the things are very simple and they very much connect to each other. And it became part of a creative process for me where I had to think in a much wider way to find a way and to survive well in this country. 
it was really interesting. A lot of people think the creative process is sit on the couch and think for something. It's not that way. It's about trying it, trying it again, completely failing, learning it. Creative people don't come up with ideas straight away. They actually dismiss other ideas very quickly. So they're used to new ideas. They get 10 of them in their head, and nine of them they dismiss immediately because they know they won't work. Because why? They've, they've failed at it before. One of the things the previous speaker was talking about, children and education, and, and I think it's incredibly important. I look at my son, who's now five and a half, and I was looking at my younger son, who's eight months old, last night going, please go to sleep. Um, but the older son, I see this amazing creativity in them. And what's different about kids when they cr do creative things is you give them an idea and they just sort of put that idea there. And it doesn't have to link into anything because they know they don't have all the information. As adults, we often make the mistake of having to link it into something. If it doesn't link in, we disregard it. I found that this, for me, couldn't work here. I had to leave things open because I didn't have solutions to them. So in that way, I developed a much faster way, I think, of thinking and finding different solutions in different areas for me. Many of them weren't solutions at the time, but they turned out to be solutions later. I saw a brilliant thing on uh, Facebook a few, uh, few weeks ago. It was a kid's test. It had said, for any biologists who could help me here, it had a line drawing of a plant, and it said, name the parts of the plant. A leaves, stem, root, that type of thing. And this kid had put, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> the teacher rubbed it out and said, wrong, and named the plant properly. He wasn't wrong. He came up with a brilliant answer. The question said, name the parts of the plant. That's exactly what he did. We know he was probably in religion class just before it because he picked the four evangelists. <laughs> but kids are really amazing. And uh, for example, my son asked me uh, a couple of months ago, and he's, he's five and a half now, he's a bit shocked. He goes, Daddy, where do babies come from? I went, oh, no way. This is way too early for this one. My wife looked at me at the breakfast table. I was only waking up. She was there like, you're on, buddy. You're on. Here we go. And I took a bit of time and I had to think about it. And I went, jeez, how am I going to figure this one out for him? And I said, OK. What was important that I knew that kids will take a piece of information, but they don't need to know the full picture. But I didn't want to give incorrect information. So I said, well, son, when a man and a woman really like each other, they make a baby by doing a very special hug. <laughs> my son looked at me, and my wife looked at me. And my son went, OK, Daddy. I breathed a sigh of relief and went on. He was happy with the information that far. I did tell him there was more information, which will be a shock when it arrives. But he, that's the way kids learn. We've got to open it up. In school, we've got a problem not just in Croatian schools. And by the way, teachers, I think, are amazing. I think they're the total heroes of our society. But the school system isn't working. It's not working here. It's not working all across the world. What we are teaching is what. What we need to teach is how. You can get as much information on Otto von Bismarck in a millisecond as the best learned professor can know on the subject for his whole life. But what we do with that information is important. Schools are trying to adapt. They're trying to think, what's coming down the line? What's coming five years down the line? Uh, as Sir Ken Robinson said in his famous TED, TED talk, we have no idea what's coming down the line. It's not just a problem that our kids, we don't know what's going to be for our kids. We don't know for us. So we're struggling. So I think the thing we is, we need to teach them how. How to connect things together. Not just the what's, but the how's. If you can figure out problem solving, that will help them generally go into the future where they have a way of solving their own problems. Because we're behind them. They're moving ahead of us. And it's impossible to teach somebody who's ahead of you. But if you trust them, if you empower them to trust their instincts, then they can be very successful going into a highly changing society. I often hear people go, I have a lot of uh, do Irish dancing, and a lot of young people who dance with us. And they say, oh, my dad and my mom want me to get a state job because the state job will secure me for life. It won't. There is no security. There is no security. It is an illusion. State jobs will go. Private jobs will go. They will come and go. And what we need to do is understand that change. And as younger people, we need to be able to, to listen to the older generation and extract the wisdom they have. 
but be very careful of the information that they're passing on, that it is up to date or relevant for our world. As a parent myself, I think about how do I pass on that information. Now, I grew up playing rugby. I know it doesn't look like I grew up playing rugby, but I did. Um, and the rules of my game are different to perhaps what my son will play. He's most likely, based on Croatia's extremely successful football team, likely to play soccer. Now, if I try to teach him my rules that I learned when I was growing up, I would say, OK, if the opposition is difficult, just slam him into the ground and stamp on his head. Well, that was the way we did it in rugby. It doesn't work in soccer. So my rules and his rules are different. The game has changed, OK? What we can tell him is that it's important that you train hard. It's important that you communicate well with your teammates. It's important that you practice. It's important that you understand each other. These are all generic things that we can pass on, a type of wisdom. So it's not just knowledge, but a wisdom that we can pass from one generation to the other. That is perhaps the translation that can happen between different generations, because they are spiraling and growing and gaining more knowledge in an exponential manner, whereas the wisdom level sort of stays the same. So, trust in your instincts, cocktail baby. Sounds a bit shocking. Uh, when my wife had uh, our first child, Liam, uh, she had a difficult pregnancy. And in fact, it's a bit stupid sort of saying it was a difficult pregnancy because I think every pregnancy is pretty difficult from what I saw. Um, but uh, the first time I got to change the baby, it was a bit of a shock for me because I was trying to put the nappy here and the baby here, but then I went to throw that away and the bin was over there. And, you know, I'm not sure it Punitsa or Punats or who had set it up, but somebody had set it up and nothing was where I needed to be. It took me 12 minutes. It was a disaster. The baby looked like MC Hammer with the hat hanging down and everything coming out. <laughs> I was not a happy camper. And trust me, my son was not happy either. So in the end of the day, I, I almost had to get my foot on top of him to reach this stuff on the other side. I redesigned it. I remembered a part, my instinct connected, former part of my life. And I worked as a waiter in America. And I worked at a thing called a Speedwell. It's a cocktail bar where you have everything ergonomically designed. So I redesigned the baby changing area, just like a cocktail bar. So instead of having your triple sec and your vodka and your gin and your whiskey up there, you had the nappies and the powder and all that different thing. So basically, you could just make a really quick cocktail of the baby. And in two minutes, he was done. He didn't know what happened. Um, so it's about taking information from one part of your life, one part of uh, an existence into another part, parts that may not look like they're related at all. Baby changing, drinking cocktails, not usually put in the same sentence, but man, they work together really well. Uh, finally, I'd like to just finish up by saying it's uh, been an exceptional pleasure to talk to you this evening. I'm really passionate about education, and I think we can move forward, and particularly with TED Talks, this is certainly the way we can do it. I'm going to leave you with a little quote from a rugby player, an Irish rugby player. They're not usually the ones uh, quoting famous lines. Uh, the tomato in the middle is what he inspired me, and it's about that difference between thinking, uh, knowledge, and wisdom. And he said, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. Thank you very much.